I welcome you all to this particular round table to exchange our views on the management of COVID-19 patients. This round table has been convened, organized by the Consortium of Accredited Healthcare Organizations, Taho, along with the, the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. And we have been duly supported by our friends from Wolfers. They are the makers of up to date, which has information about COVID-19 and other things and has been made available free of cost to all physicians. <laughs> we are requesting them to make it until May and all that. We'll, we are working with them to see that it becomes available to all of us. So to conduct this, I don't want to kind of take away. We have very, very illustrious people. I'm in particular extremely happy to see Dr. Peter from CMC Vellore, who is like a, one of the leaders. I am missing at the moment Dr. Dhruv Chaudhary, who mm -hmm. had a in some meeting at this moment, but will be joining a little later. So my great behalf also. And I'll be handing over the meeting to my friend Dr. Arindam Kar. So Arindam, you may please uh, kind of take it further. For kind permission, sir, I would uh, request everyone to introduce themselves. And I will start with myself. I am Dr. Arindam Kaur. I'm working in uh, the eastern uh, part of India called Kolkata. And I am also the general secretary elect for Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. And uh, with uh, Dr. Vijay Agarwal's permission, I would be putting up the question. So the easier, uh, but, but not the answers. Uh, so the easier part is most of uh, relying on me. So uh, I would ask our uh, friends and colleagues from China to introduce themselves first and then we'll go one by one for the Indian people who are in the web meeting. We would like to thank President Dr. Vidi and uh, the President of uh, ISCCM and uh, Walter Grover company for supporting us and uh, offer this opportunity to share our experience uh, fighting against COVID-19. Thank you all. Yeah, Dr. Vidi, sir, please. Yeah, I'm Dr. Vishnu Kanegare. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Kali Institute of Medical Sciences in Bhubaneswar. It's a medical college hospital that has for various information. We are now running 950 uh, COVID hospital beds. 500 beds are in, in Bhubaneswar, it's the main hospital. And uh, 450 beds are spread out of our three districts. Uh, mm -hmm. 200, 200 each, and one in uh, Kulwani, which is just coming back. 150 beds. So this is how we have uh, gone about it. It's a public private partnership. Uh, between the government of Odisha uh, schemes and uh, the uh, private person funding it. So we have always got uh, patients in the main hospital in Kundeshwar. Patients have been treated, have been uh, discharged by now. So I'll uh, hand over to the next person. Thank you, Alna. Yeah, the, I think that you are in the hot seat, sir. You are, you are managing so many. <laughs> so take care of yourself and, and be safe, sir. Dr. Sumit, sir. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, uh, I would uh, first of all congratulate the team from China for uh, having done such great work. I am uh, I am head of critical care medicine at Artemis Hospital near Delhi, and we also run a COVID unit. We have only had three patients till date, so I am new to the game. I think uh, Mohan, you are on the line, Dr. Mohan Maharaj. Yeah. Yeah, thanks to all the doctors who have been joined here. Let us uh, use more of the subject and knowledge sharing. And my name is Dr. Mohan Maharaj, working in uh, Vishakhapatnam Care Hospital. Uh, we have two units, one unit for uh, COVID isolation, separately we made it. I'm Dr. Joseph. I belong to the southernmost tip of India, a place called Thinalveli. It is 95 kilometers north of uh, Kanyagumari. And I'm presently the Chief Operational Officer and Critical Care Consultant of 140 bedded hospitals. We have allocated a separate block for COVID isolation. It consists of around 60 beds. Uh, one of the major problems that we face at this point of time is uh, the we cater to a large population of Muslim patients who are presumed, we only presume them to be positive and we, done, we run a separate uh, flu clinic where it is scored and then sent whether uh, a separate clinic should be maintained or not. Right at this point of time, we don't have any 
positive cases at this point of time in my hospital. Okay. Uh, may I have a so, question? Yeah. Um, are, are we going to start from questions directly, or because I know that Dr. Wan and uh, his colleagues already prepared a presentation to share their experiences. So I'm just wondering, perhaps we uh, start with their presentation. The, the idea was that we were not aware that there would be some presentation. So what I would uh, suggest because there are uh, multiple number of people and this is more of a web meeting than a webinar. So uh, we have incorporated the points that were given by you into our discussion. You can see in the chat that these are the questions or the sub uh, your topics and subtopics that we are planning to include in our uh, your discussion and we have kept the discussion very fluidly. So we wanted to have a bi-directional flow of information as well as uh, discussion so that we both uh, en enrich ourselves in this web meeting and also we would like to in a, in a future webinar which we are planning with a, within a week time that what should be the exact points that we should portray or convey to the entire population of Southeast Asia. So that's why it, I think we should stick to a little bit of discussion mode rather than a presentation mode. But uh, I will go with your suggestion. All right, yeah. <laughs> Although we have prepared the slides for, you know, for, uh, for 10 questions. And uh, yes, I understand uh, what, what you are talking about. So uh, let's, let's directly talk about the question, okay? Yes, we will, we will not share the slides. Okay. Uh, Arindam, go ahead, please. Yeah, sir. Uh, I think the first, maybe the question, right, that we, we all know about the epidemiology. In fact, we are actually, a lot of, many of the people are complaining that we are overburdened with the, the webinar dosage, right? And some people are saying that it has got more mortality than the COVID itself, right? So, mortality and morbidity than the COVID itself. So jokes apart, uh, I would be very asking some hard hitting questions, which has, uh, which the answers which are not very clear as of now. And if we get those answers, it would be much easier for us to go ahead. You see, the first question that I want to ask, and as you have more experience by uh, than by us, and, and and our Indian colleagues and seniors are also free to ask any questions. Just raise your hand so that I can go to you and give you that opportunity to ask the questions. So any, we all by uh, now this time, we all know by this time that uh, uh, a lot of times we are actually being fooled by the presentations, right? So do you, uh, do you think, are there any uh, features in particularly in asymptomatic patients so uh, any any particular clinical feature so that we can pick up that we can have a premonition that this could be an asymptomatic COVID patient. Anything, any suggestive sort of thing. Um, so are, are you asking, are you asking any featured symptoms that a COVID-19 patients have that can help you to pick out? Yes, something, uh, something which is beyond the fever and cough. We all know fever, sore throat and cough. Anything, any any uh, peculiar thing that you guys have picked up? About the COVID-19, the patient has cough, fever, uh, and uh, they have the uh, same uh, symptom as the common flu. So it's hard to uh, make sure the patient whether have the COVID-19 or flu according to the symptoms. So, a, a, any question from the Indian Indian people? I would say any answer. I, I don't think that uh, at the moment, uh, to our knowledge, in asymptomatic patients, mm. uh, because they, that is the reason you are calling them asymptomatic, is because the other symptoms, if they had fever, cough, or maybe I think uh, loss of smell, uh, or uh, I would say taste, is something that has been attributed to these things, but majority of okay, them uh, are treated as symptoms. Uh, my, my apologize. I yeah. thought we were talking about patients, but not 
We are talking about asymptomatic. Asymptomatic, yes. We are saying right, right. He okay, had no symptoms, but even then, other than the history of contact uh -huh. and uh, of coming in contact with this and that, but other than that, is there anything to anybody uh, in our Understand. group? Yes, I. Uh, maybe the gastrointestinal symptom is common in those patients, such as abdominal pain and diarrhea, uh, nausea. Uh, yet we found that nearly half of the patients have uh, digestive symptoms. Uh, yeah, so we remind you to uh, pay some pay, pay attention to this kind of this kind of symptom. Uh, on the gastrointestinal, okay? Sir, with your permission, can I ask our Indian colleagues who are treating, uh, have you have had the experience of some atypical presentations, particularly what Peter sir has asked about, whether presentation within myocarditis or even myocardial infarction are very uh, pr presenting with absolutely GI symptoms. Any, anyone who can uh, volunteer, yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Our Indian friends, Dr. Vatsal, Dr. Pandit. I think I remember we can. So, um, yeah, or, okay, that's good. We had a 56 year old man who was COVID positive who rapidly went on to the ventilator, but uh, he kind of stabilized and was. Doing fairly okay, he had kind of come down to around 40% oxygen and his uh, parameters were also getting better and then he had a sudden cardiac death. So we feel that probably he had myocarditis and that's what then caused a sudden cardiac arrest in him. So that is one uh, presentation which is kind of different from the usual respiratory problems though myocarditis has and you know possibly myocardial infarction has been described in uh, the COVID patients. Maybe they may have a hypercoagulable state, but we feel that in this patient who was otherwise sort of stabilizing, probably the heart gave way, and that's why he had a sudden cardiac death. And uh, uh, and also another question which we are which we are getting, uh, I will ask both to the, our Indian and Chinese colleagues, is that a lot of uh, pregnancy patient, particularly at the late term of pregnancy, they are turning out to be asymptomatic, but yet positive. So what is your experience about it? Pregnancy, particularly the late uh, term of third trimester pregnancy. Yeah, we are sorry that we we, we, we don't have such kind of patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We didn't treat the pregnant patients. We're sorry with that. I think Arindam, this is Sumit. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah I, would, I think we should restrict. I think uh, the people we are discussing with from China also are intensivists. I think should we restrict our discussion to the intensive I, management? I agree, sir. I, I think, uh, Arindam, let's Yes, sir, I will do that. Uh, my apologies. So I actually, uh, West Bengal got a lot of patients on that and one, two, three patients uh, deteriorated very rapidly. So I asked that question. Okay. My next question, which actually came from our Chinese friends, right? Where that, are there any clinical or biochemical prognostic markers, right? Uh, so that we can, uh, because what we have seen from different uh, uh, informations coming up, that these patients were doing initially well, and then they suddenly on the fifth or seventh day, right, they suddenly deteriorate and then go into some sort of uh, requiring higher vent, uh, respiratory support in form of ventilation and others. So are there any clinical or biochemical prognostic markers which can identify patients who might deteriorate in the later stages? Yeah, I have prepared for this question. And can I share a slide for you? So. Uh, uh, okay, sorry. there it is. So, uh, is there any parameters predict the, the patient who getting worse? Yeah, especially uh, those patients who may go to ARDS. Yeah, this, this, this is a common question that all of us, including the critical care physicians, focus on. So, uh, 
from our experience to, uh, to fighting against COVID-19 in Wuhan, we found that efficient combined, combined with the following two or more factors, they are more likely to go into ARDS, such as uh, uh, the elderly patient and the patient complicated with severe chronic mm -hmm. diseases, including chronic cardiac insufficiency, malignant tumor, and the lung disease, and uh, you know some patients who get chemotherapy or radiotherapy, yes. they are at immunosuppression. And and another very important indicator is the total lymphocyte count. If the patient underwent a, a persistent lower uh, lymphocyte yes. count, uh, you know uh, they may uh, getting worse probably. Uh, and we found that in uh, in our among our patients, uh, the patient who died, several patients who died, they, all of them have a uh, persistent lower TLC, total lymphocyte count. Uh, so uh, we need to pay attention on this on this one. Okay. Yes. So uh, another one is uh, rapid expansion of the lesion indicated by CT scan. Uh, however, I, as I know, uh, not all of the patients uh, can uh, have CT scan every day or every week. So uh, we should uh, focus on the oxygenation, focus on oxygenation. And uh, uh, no obvious improvement in oxygenation index after applying a high flow nasal cannula or a high flow oxygen supply. We should pay attention on that. They may get worse. And uh, the other indicator including uh, blood lactic level and d dimer is very, also very, very important. If they keep increased, we should, we should, we should, uh, we should uh, be aware of that, okay? Uh, the other thing I want to talk is the uh, cytokine storm syndrome, uh, which, uh, you know, some of the patient, severe patient, feel similar to CSS. And the patient have a persistent, persistent fever, elevated, significant elevated interleukin-6, and the other, you know, other cytokines, including TNF-alpha, or interferon gamma, and the other interleukins. Uh, and they have also have uh, elevated D-dimer and uh, the other inflammation markers. So, uh, you know, the, this cytokine can cause, uh, you know, capillary leak and uh, they can cause, uh, you know, cause uh, uh, the, the endothelial damage and shock. And the cytokine storm also could, it also can, uh, can lead to a multiple organ failure, uh, including ARDS and including including the cardiovascular shock and DIC and renal failure and cardiac failure. So uh, the CSS is very important uh, for the patient uh, with COVID-19. Uh, for the treatment of CSS, uh, we still have no clear results. Maybe you could, uh, you could try downstream uh, treatment uh, such as cytokine inhibitor. Uh, there are, you know, uh, uh, the use of uh, interleukin-6 inhibitor, such as uh, this, this agent, uh, tocilizumab. Yeah, this has been proposed to disrupt this, this uh, information response and uh, maybe improve the outcomes. But, you know, there are a lot of clinical trials already. Uh, in this, yes, in the, the, the clinical trial website, certain, certain clinical trial, but uh, there, there's no published data. Uh, but I, I, I want to say uh, an upstream treatment may be better. Uh, you know, the corticosteroid uh, may work in such kind, uh, especially the, the pro-inflammation set of kinds release. Maybe it works. It maybe it works. And at Vero, this is the basic, the basic of the treatment. We should 
we should uh, focus on this. Uh, that's my, uh, my opinion with that. Thank you. I think, uh, okay. Dr. Wang, we can come back then to uh, your slides again. OK. Come back to where? Uh, so, I think he has answered the question that uh, Dr. Arindam Kar asked. Yes. That question, question has been answered. Uh, so we can go back to the discussion now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. And uh, on also, we are a little bit uh, India is little, uh, we, are, we are changing our strategy every time and then, and we are not very sure, but which is, we are sure about that RT-PCR is the way to diagnose, but it is costly and it is not that widely available and the availability is varying in different states. That what would be the role of rapid antibody testing and what was China's uh, strategy of utilizing the rapid testing? In, and and in, in which way they have used it. The question is a little late. I think Dr. Sumit wants to reply on that. Yeah, Dr. Sumit. Uh, no, I don't want to reply on that. Just continuing the discussion on the cytokine storm. Can I ask a question? Because did you see a younger subset of patients getting the cytokine storm or it could be at any age group? Because historically, if we see the Spanish flu, it was those the younger patients died of cytokine storm while the malnourished and the elderly died of secondary bacterial infection so did that fit the picture here too in in covid we, we didn't observe the you know the age difference uh, okay. of the cytokine storm yeah oh thank you thank you okay so uh, should i go to the next one uh, no, I think uh, they, they, they were ready to answer your question on the diagnostic test. Okay, so then we'll take that question, sir. Uh, we'll take that question, sort of, yeah. yeah. Okay, so use, back to the question about the test, testing. Yeah, yes, use of is. antibody testing. How China has uh, done their uh, mass screening or your surveillance, which, which sort of test they have utilized? We have both. We have both. Uh, you know, the RT-PCR test, we can have the result in one day. And for the uh, antibody test, we, we can have the result, you know, uh, this day or the other, or the next day. So uh, the test for the, this patient is very quickly in China. Uh, both of the, you know, the new nucleic exit test and the antibody test are, you know, not important for the patient. One interesting question suggested by uh, some of our Indian colleagues, right, that how to identify patients who are uh, sort of on a higher risk to get into uh, some advanced respiratory system. What they're doing is that they're doing a three minute walk test, right? So it is more of a because we have seen a lot of people either doing ABG. Some institutions check yes, the CT scan, uh, and 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 some people, which is more of a very uh, handy, useful, and easily implementable, is doing a three-minute walk test. And if the patient is unable to uh, keep the breath on, sort of uh, they're panting for breath or dyspnea, then those patients are being identified to be on higher risk to get into uh, respiratory support. Yeah, Dr. Pandit, your, your, your suggestion on this? Yeah, look, uh, we, we use it all the time. And uh, what we have found is that those patients who desaturate, uh, say, within the three minutes time of simple walking in the ICU, just around the cubicle or in the room, uh, to 85% are the ones who are actually going to worsen. And immediately we have action plan for those patients. So they are immediately uh, put up on HFNC, they are nurse prone, and we consider low dose corticosteroid, one milligram per kilogram of methylprednisolone at that stage, if we have to. And, and regarding one question came from uh, Dr. Peters himself, right? So he was trying to come up uh, with a question that if we are using steroids and what, what is the agent of choice? Because I, I, I spoke to a lot of people from throughout India. So many of the pre are preferring methylprednisolone, some are giving prednisolone. 
so uh, let us ask our chinese friends and then come back to our indian colleagues about the choice of the steroids what is the choice of the steroid in 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 china itself so uh, can i ask uh, dr vatsal dr sunil anup and sumit sir to so i i agree with what rahul said we are also utilizing either a 3 or a 6 minute walk test to identify those who are otherwise looking relatively asymptomatic to tell so you better making them walk more sorry you are making I mean, them walk depends. more yeah. the younger ones probably 6 minutes right. and uh, right. if there is a desaturation again that's something that tells you that probably there is a subclinical inflammation occurring in the lung which can progress into an ARDS so that's where we would be utilizing uh, the steroids so we use is uh, rather a low dose of methylprednisolone 30 mg twice a day for 3 weeks we also use steroids in an uh, in individual who given tocilizumab but who continue to manifest inflammatory uh, you know uh, problems and therefore we gave the steroids and then he improved right okay and anyone else wants to about the steroid itself my question is my question is walk test how can it differentiate between ards and micro from by formation in the pulmonary vessels and causing a vq mismatch so you know deciding to give steroid based on just the walk test let see little worrying to me so sumit uh, rahul here yeah it doesn't tell you whether it has got ards or not but it tells you that this right. patient definitely has some inflammation Of obviously course. it's an acute clinical assessment at that point whether you think that this patient needs to definitely go on steroid or not not everybody is blanketly giving steroid what sir you can correct me if i have got a if you got a different opinion to that absolutely but, yeah 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 but so, that's where the that's where the clinical assessment comes in, in, in into place you actually examine these patients you ask them to do a 3 to 6 minute walk test and then if they are really into the extreme and you think that this is really a, a concern for you clinically you can do a substantiate that with an abg at that point if you want to as the pf ratio is drop definitely those could be the candidate i would do for uh, consider of them for um, uh, steroids if the if they just become a bit short of breath hypoxia sorry? hypoxia could be because of either of these reasons right yes. by a walk test and an abg you can't differentiate that what would yeah, differentiate the walk is not the brisk walk it's a very very small no, i understand yeah no no i understand that but microembolization of the pulmonary vessels increased pulmonary artery hypertension acute versus ards i don't think we can differentiate you can differentiate that it is a severe or a non severe illness to give steroids or not i think it would be a next level of management where you look at the ct scan or the x ray to see if there are ards changes along with a poor pf ratio sir so, uh, when i spoke to many people uh, yesterday uh, right. regarding this one that how to differentiate and who gets the steroid right so the consensus that i got is that the first clinical suspicion which can be done by the walk test okay. then maybe the supplementation will come in form of uh, your x ray or ct scan as well as some biochemical so what people are doing is that that the first screening is a walk test second is your pf ratio as well as the ct scan features which yes. shows more of a infiltrates and then it can be supplemented by the lab values of crp ldh ferritin and d dimer that i agree that that, 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 is, that is logical problem. that is absolutely logical yeah but sumit that's what happens in real life you have all that information right. along with the walk test you just don't uh, do the walk right, test right. take up a decision no no because because uh, when you said it that it sounded like the taking the decision on the walk test about the steroids because the steroid no, you, is you, that's why you examine the patient maybe i i got i got it wrong yeah i, I got it wrong uh, probably so remember that the chinese friends i think want to uh, show something okay uh, yeah yes sir, yes i think let them yeah yes about <laughs> glucocorticoid the, the question about uh, glucocorticoid usage and uh, this is from uh, Pro professor uh, li uh yes go ahead please okay next one and uh, uh, the clinical evidence does not support uh, glucocorticoid treatment for covid-19 um and uh, the 
uh, mild patients definitely do not need to use the glucocorticoids. Uh, in our patient, because uh, we have uh, the treatment, uh, the patient we treatment are all the severe patients, so we use glucocorticoids for them, and it showed infective. But the total course is five to seven days at most. And when we uh, look for what kind of people should use the glucocorticoids, the most important uh, indicator is the oxygen situation. Uh, and if the patient has the SAO2 below 93%, uh, and we uh, uh, and about the oxygen index uh, below 300 millimeter mercury, we will use the glucocorticoids at once. And we uh, usually use the mesoprotein solom, uh, one to two milligram per kilogram per day, and the total course is less than seven days. Uh, so the oxygenation index was deteriorating, and uh, we could also observe the uh, CT image changes. But you know, actually, not a uh, patient cannot do CT scan every day. Uh, and uh, another uh, indicator is the inflammatory reaction was overactivated like the patient has the symptom of fever and cannot mm, below the uh, normal temperature and the uh, interleukin-6 elevated most. Uh, so so uh, in our experience, we think the glucocorticoid treatment is an effective drug to treat the severe pneumonia for COVID-19. Uh, and uh, the use of glucocorticoids uh, has little influence of the virus clearance. And the total course is seven days. But for some people who could, who could use the glucocorticoids for a long time, the side effect should be uh, obvious. Uh, for example, the fungal uh, infection or others. Uh, all about the glucocorticoids. Any, any, ma'am, yeah, uh, any timing that you are thinking of? It should, should it be very early in the course of the disease? And if you are using any of the lab value, you can six. Are there uh, any? Is it arbitrary or there is any, any cut off? Mm -hmm. uh, the oxygen situation, uh, the o oxygen index, uh, indicator. Mm -hmm which is below 300 millimeter mercury C and uh, the SAO2, uh, the uh, situation of the oxygen below 93%, uh, we will use the glucocorticoids at once. For CVR patient, we all use the glucocorticoids. Yeah. Any, of, any of our Indian friends? Can so so my, my, my question was that when, when you're deciding to give these glucocorticoids, does it make sense to give them earlier on to prevent them from going to a severe stage? Because are we dealing essentially with a problem when you look at the cytokine uh, storm scenario, are you dealing with a situation where the viral replication has become excessive and that's why there are too many cytokines or it's a dysregulated host response which is causing the problem? So that's what I think your question was, Arindam, that in looking at your interleukin-6 or any other kind of inflammatory markers, can you identify individuals who are going to go down this pathway, whether it is through a walk test plus their CRP and interleukin-6 levels, and that can then thereby tell you that you want to go in for an earlier corticosteroid use so that you don't land up with these individuals being failing HFNC and going on to an invasive ventilation. I, 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 that's, that's really a good question. And, uh, you know, the uh, interleukin-6 uh, is, you know, is uh, elevated, significant, significant elevated in the patient who will uh, turn to worse.
yeah, we, we monitor uh, this kind of change. For CRP, uh, you know, this is not specific. Uh, so we prefer to use interleukin-6, right? Interleukin-6 uh, and maybe associated with the other pro-inflammatory cytokines such as dnf uh, But uh, interleukin-6 is better than the other cytokines. I think. Can we can we see that slide of that cytokine storm again? Because are we besides TNF alpha and interleukin six? Are you measuring anything else to prognosticate these patients? So, uh, do you mean this slide? Yeah, this slide. So you know, in the cytokine storm, TNF alpha interferons and all these other interleukins. Are you measuring anything else there in your center which can tell you besides IL-6, you said other cytokines. So are you looking at other cytokines which are giving you an answer that maybe we should start giving the steroids a little earlier and suppress these T cells which are probably creating some mischief? The, the best way to predict the patient who is at the risk of getting worse is to uh, keep dynamic monitor the, the indicators. Uh, cytokine is, uh, you know, is an, uh, it's part of the indicator and we should measure the others such as the leukocyte, uh, lymphocyte count and the X-ray or CT scan and the oxygenation theaters and the black lactate and D-dimer. We should measure, you know, uh, measure if, if, if possible, measure all of them to predict, not just using one single indicator or one single cytokine to predict who will get in worse. And I, I think maybe, uh, you know, a monitor, um, uh, a dynamic monitor, maybe uh, two days, three days to test uh, this, this is better, yeah, to predict the patient. Yeah. Okay. Any, anyone you. asking any question or should I ask uh, the next one? Yeah, yeah like uh, w w what is the incidence of uh, macrophage activation syndrome uh, by looking at uh, X score or any other criteria? Do you observe macrophage activation syndrome very regularly? And in uh, that group of patients, is there any uh, additional benefit of uh, starting steroids or the tocilizumab? You can type, yeah, HLH or macrophage activation syndrome. So by that time, we'll come back to that question once they go through it. Right. Correct. Just so, one quick question to yes, Dr. Yes. Wang. Um, is there any way that you can look at the viremia in the blood? Can you actually do a kind of quantitative viremia of the, uh, mm -hmm. in, in the blood when there is a cytokine storm to tell you whether there is you know, the cytokines are going up and the viral load is going down or vice versa. Yeah, so, you know, we look at viral viral detection in the PCR when we look at the nasopharyngeal secretions, etc. But can you actually look at a quantitative viral load in the blood at the degree of viremia? We, 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 we do not do the virus test from the blood sample. Any particular reason? Because I'm sure it'll give some kind of prognostic idea about what's happening within, uh, in terms of the virus spreading out from the pulmonary, you know, the respiratory system into the systemic circulation, you know, and thereby causing more and more of uh, cytokine release and multi-organ dysfunction. So, you know, just as we can measure RNA viruses, uh, say hepatitis uh, C, for instance, in the blood, is there no kind of quantitative test for this particular virus in the blood? Uh, uh, so maybe right, because so the, if we can test the virus in the upper airway, it means the patient can get a healthy people infection. So uh, it is not only for the diagnosis, but also for the um, prevent uh, to how to prevent the healthy. Oh, but just like you measure HIV and HCV, is there any test coming up which can measure the degree of the virions in the blood itself? Uh, but sir, I don't yeah. think so. There are, are, are any sort of, I think, uh, let them speak. Yeah, Dr. Right. Wang. Dr. Wang. Uh, yeah, I, I, I remember 
but I cannot remember exactly uh, which journal published such kind of research. They measured the, the blood samples for RT-PCR for the SARS coronavirus too. And, uh, but uh, in the clinical, uh, in our wards, we didn't measure that. We didn't measure the blood. We measured, we measured, you know, the nasopharyngeal samples. We measured the sputum lower from the lower uh, respiratory tract. And we also, you know, for the patient who would like to, who, who may could discharge from the hospitals, we would measure the, the urine samples and the stool samples to, uh, to uh, you know, to, uh, to make sure that, you know, the patients do not have, you know, infectious, uh, they, they will not uh, infect the other people. Yeah. Okay, uh, I have two very interesting questions. Yeah, I will start with the first one, which came from our friend Anu. The first one, which we, he's telling that there are the Kerala is observing the southern part of uh, India is observing a persistent PCR positivity beyond uh, the one month, right? Particularly the HNL type. Yeah. So. What was your, and, and the patient has become asymptomatic. The patient has done well, clinically fine, but the PCR activity is still going on beyond one month. So this is a trend that they have absorbed, observed. So what is the Chinese experience about it? Anup, am I right with the question? You asked that more yeah, than a month. Like, yeah. uh, not very commonly, like out of this uh, 380 patients, some uh, two patients only we observe that. More than 30, uh, 30 days. And again, a paper is published where they have observed a positivity up to 58 days. They have not crossed with the viral culture. So when we are facing such situation, how to go ahead other than uh, doing the viral culture, is there any other method of uh, like uh, uh, facing that situation? And again, any change in the treatment uh, options also in that situation? Yeah, we have a lot of people uh, whose uh, CT scan shows a uh, cure but the PCR results are also positive for about 13 to 14 days. And uh, uh, for this kind of, of patient, we can use the, use the inferent uh, neutralization treatment to help them to clearance the virus. Uh, and for some patients who have uh, uh, confirmed the discharge uh, standard and we will discharge them and maybe they have the PCR test in the isolation spot and it showed uh, positive again and for this kind of patient we will have them in hospital again. Am I clear? No, like uh, the, my yeah, question. Anup, I, Anup, the question was in two form actually if we, yeah. if we reframe it and I think it is useful for all of us both for clinical and epidemiological reasons. So we are finding two trends. One is we are worried about two trends. One is a persistent positivity even despite a clinical improvement, right? Because exactly. are, and what also China and Korea has started reporting, the patient did well, both the clinical and your PCR negativity has achieved and now again they have come positive. So whether we are also dealing with a reinfection. So I think we have to wait for a lot of other data to come, whether it has a potential to reinfect. And some of the patients are actually having a prolonged and protracted PCR activity. So any comment from our Indian? I want to add something, yeah. You know, for the patient, uh, uh, patient who discharged from the hospital and, you know, the RT-PCR is positive again. You know, uh, the government in China, the, uh, they uh, will let the patient stay, uh, come to the, come to the, you know, uh, 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 place to, for quarantine, for quarantine, for two weeks. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the two week quarantine will, uh, will make sure that they will contact with the other, people and make uh, you know the infection risk is, is is low and if the patient 
uh, will test positive again, they will send to the hospital again. Okay. So, Dr. Peter, okay. uh, we are finding patients who are positive beyond 30 days, uh, totally become asymptomatic. Uh, we are not quite clear as to why this is happening, whether uh, they are uh, you know, still uh, actively infected or not. A couple of patients are still positive beyond 30 days. So do you think, uh, it is question to all of you, an open question. So do you think where there is a, a persistent positive PCR something, uh, will uh, antibody, both quantitative or qualitative or a quantitative with a titer, will, the, will that, that test identify a person who is potentially, uh, potential to infect other people or who is now immune or maybe the viral markers are there? Do you think that would be a useful strategy? No, Arindav, can I add one point? That the, yes, please. Actually, like with, uh, looking at PCR positivity alone, you may not be able to comment on infectivity because you may be just uh, uh, testing some uh, uh, viral particles, viral RNA particles. Right. So definitely, we'll have to get a viral culture done. But my question was, like, the one, one you asked is correct because when there is no proper antibody response, they are likely to have a persistent viremia. Then other than that, when we are having such a persistent viremic situations, is there anything extra like regarding the treatment part we have to do uh, to overcome that if they are uh, like really infective? I, I have no clue on this answer. Our Chinese friends can help or anyone from India itself. Because this is a very tricky question. <laughs> you see, we are saying uh, good, good evening, everybody. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, you see, this is a question which we are facing. Person is having a continuous patient is clinically asymptomatic. Continue to have your uh, PCR positive. What could be the possible reasons? As uh, Anup said, first and foremost, we need to look at the false positivity. That is one part. Because the dead bacillus or dead virus, like we look at maybe one part. Secondly, I think it is extremely important to see whether from one place you are getting it or not. I think we still are gone out of the respiratory system. Probably feces is in other places where we can look at it. The reason I'm saying so is because there is a delayed clearance. If you are finding it both places and there is an active inflammation, that's why we look at it, probably person is having continue to have it. Third thing which is important, which will coming up in a time is <laughs> antibodies. If your antibody levels are still not built up, then, then probably that is a very tricky thing. If you have developed an antibody area and then you are still finding it, uh, the, the, so probability of shorter viral culture, it will not be possible, which is practically if I talk in India, except for a couple of centers, it may not be possible at all. And uh, it's only in Bhopal where you have VSL-5 facilities or maybe in maybe Pune. So, so you have to take a clinical call. The only challenge will come up, can you discharge these patients or not from the practical perspective? That, that will be only, but I think I would like to have it from other place, which has a longer duration. If it is negative there, then probably, again, it's a probability, not, not definition. And evidence does not mean a proof of that this is now infected. I, I, I think we have answered this and mostly a combination of both. And as well as uh, not only in theoreticality, we have to think practicality and pragmatically on, on that part. Okay, the second question also came from Anup is that what is the incidence of HLH or macrophage activation syndrome found in, 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 in COVID infection? What is the Chinese experience about it? It is like uh, in this group of patients, you are going to uh, try plasma paresis because in the ICMR protocols are seen that uh, in Bellur, you are starting plasma flex for some group of patients. So this group of patients you are trying to for flex, what is your inclusion criteria for that? I can't hear you very well. There is two. There are two types of plasma-based therapy. One is convalescent plasma. Second is plasma exchange. Now we are trying to extrapolate data from other disease processes which have presented with HLH, and we found that in those other disease processes, plasma exchange seems to improve outcomes in those who have gone into HLH. We have not yet seen a patient COVID-positive patient with HLH. So our thinking is that we could potentially offer uh, HLH for those who have 
some of the manifestations of HLH. The convalescent plasma is a totally altogether a different equation which can be used as therapy once we are able to get, uh, get enough samples. No, sir, when you are opting for plex, you will go with only plex or you will continue with the steroids or other MAB or something like that? Okay, our protocol uh, here is that we use a small dose of steroids along with the plex. Uh, it's half to one milligram per kg is what has been used in other clinical settings. So we will support them also with uh, uh, low dose steroids. So the combination of three, if you may so. Two. Steroid with plex. Steroids and plex, yeah. Okay. And and also as, as we were also discussing on the cytokines, I think Dr. Sumit was also asking about some cytokines modulation therapy. Dr. Sumit, you want to ask? Or maybe Sunil, you were you, you, you were little you are jumping on the seat regarding the cytokine modulation or something. So any one of you, Sunil and, and Dr. Sumit sir. Sunil, go ahead, uh, then I'll join. No, no, you, you, you go on, uh, Sumit. You, uh, you are talking about the cytokine. Go ahead. Okay, so my, my question is to one is that <clears throat> the cytokine storm, uh, that, uh, my question initially was uh, which subset, which age group of patients, uh, but they didn't have any data based on that. But the cytokine storm, the other part is that the cyto in the Indian context, where we have very high secondary infection rates because of the organisms that we have, cytokine suppression in the cytokine storm is <coughs> productive in the Indian setting because it will make the patient prone to severe secondary infections. Yeah, the uh, use of the steroids may increase the, the incre uh, infection of bacteria and even uh, fungus. Uh, but, uh, you know, when uh, we're considering using the steroid, we need to, you know, to measure the benefit and the risk. Right. If the patient, if the patient would die of the cytokine storm, we probably, we, 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 we should use that. And uh, if the patient, you know, the patient uh, have severe bacterial or, you know, the fungal infection, uh, uh, maybe we, 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 we consider not using, using that, the steroid. Uh, you know, so people always say that, you know, the using of steroid, we, we also increase the risk of virus. Uh, virus infection. We will make right. virus, virus infection getting worse. But uh, from our clinical practice, we we do not <laughs> agree with that. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, at the you know the proper time, at a proper dose, the use of story is good for the patient. This is our experience. It right. may uh, it may uh, 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 makes the you know oxygen getting better. But, yeah, you know, uh, 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 on, on continuation of your question, Dr. Sumit, uh, I just, uh, as Rahul is not there, they have used tocilizumab in two patients and right. then one, uh, your uh, uh, confirmed fungal infection, blood culture positive fungal infection that had happened. And also right. I think my question would be to Dr. Peter, Dr. Dhruv also in, in this regard, whether using of tocilizumab increases the risk uh, of uh, your fluorid tuberculosis because we have a very high endemicity of tuberculosis in, in yes. India itself. Dr. Peter sir, Dr. Dhruv sir. See, Arendna, uh, I have no experience of tesiluzumab. Whatever the experience I have of tesiluzumab is in, uh, uh, in the context of my friends uh, from Medanta, where two patients have been given recently tesiluzumab. One was given to the Italian uh, lady who was hospitalized there. She died. It was given to another medical professional who had come from abroad and had uh, and had uh, uh, COVID-19 bilateral pneumonia, and he has been extubated day before yesterday. So, so, so it's equivocal. And to say that A is active or B is active, I think I'm not qualified to comment upon that. Still, these are early days. But my, but my own feeling is 
that yes, there is a cytokine storm, no doubt about it. But putting it up, tacilizumab, and for how long it continues to immunosuppression and how long it is going to take, clearance of viruses, these are the questions which need to answer. So, so I have personally no experience, but I'm telling you because of these two, I was involved indirectly, so I have some idea. Can I, can I just, I mean, it's a kind of a question come a thought. You know, the, the, the problem with the cytokine storm, which I have, not just here, probably, I mean, is that even in sepsis, and this has been repeatedly done, is that when you suppress the cytokine storm in a certain way, the patient gets and dies of a secondary infection and other problems down the line, and the death is not connected to the immediate cytokine storm because the cytokine storm has been suppressed, but finally the die, patient dies later. So outcomes are, is the most important thing to watch in this. Does using these improve overall outcome, not just oxygenation and the ARDS or the suppression of the cytokine, uh, cytokine storm and all the IL-6 levels, etc. Because if the patient dies in the Indian context, I don't know the Chinese context, 15 days later, because he has a secondary infection because of the suppression of the cytokine storm, I think it is a counterproductive, it, it, it will end up to be not very productive. I think, Sumit, you said it very bluntly. I was very subtle about it. But I have <laughs> not too much of experience. Therefore, I was just uh, holding my guns. But you see, I had six as a response of infections and all. So it, 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 I have a somehow, uh, it's again a presumption or conjunction. No evidence, nothing. But what I feel, it may not go the APC way. See, we need more studies on the same. We've used it in two patients. One was a 56-year-old physician who had a high IL-6, a lot of inflammatory markers being positive, persistent fever after two weeks. And he had a partial response to tocilizumab. Then we gave him steroids and he got better. He's been discharged. One was a 76-year-old gentleman who had gone to Pakistan and came back and fell ill and got intubated, ventilated. We had used tocilizumab and steroids in him. He's got better. He's been extubated. But I agree, we do need uh, more studies to kind of decide between which is worse, the immunosuppression or the inflammation. Uh, Dr. Peters, would you like to add because you have been typing in something? Dr. Vatsal, like what dose you are using? Uh, Tocilizumab, 400 milligram or 80, 80 milligram, low dose? No, 400 milligrams. I think Dr. Peter is not available to comment. Sunil, you can ask your question or you can comment. I just wanted to ask uh, Chinese friends, uh, what is their experience with other forms of uh, cytokine clearance, like uh, the extracorporeal devices, have they used, and if so, what was their experience with that? Uh, using the blood dialysis or blood purific uh, blood purification? Blood purification, yeah, blood purification. Yeah. To clear, to, you know, to remove the cytokines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, in, in the hospital of uh, Wuhan People's Hospital, you know, there's a team, medical team, who uh, who is doing this uh, clinical trial. They, they they use the you know the blood purification to uh, clear the cytokine to remove the cytokines. Uh, but I, I uh, we also have several patients uh, involved in the clinical trial. Uh, but uh, actually, I really. I'm not sure with the you know the outcome of this, you know, the, the the impact of the on outcome on the prognosis using this way, because as I know as I uh, you know this is downstream of the cytokine storm, you know to clear the cytokine storm, to, to clear the cytokines and the cytokine will will uh, will generate again, it will uh, increase again, mm. so. I, for, for myself, I prefer to use, uh, you know, maybe there is a way to control the origination of the cytokine. Rather <laughs> than the downstream format. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I completely got it. So a, a, any, any comment from the, our Indian friends? Any experience, any of the centers using it, uh, the cytokine removal strategy? Dr. Simran, Dr. Mohan, Anup, anyone you want to uh, contribute? Can I just ask a question to yes, Dr. Yes, Vatsal? Yeah. Vatsal, what was the age group of patients that you used tocilumab and uh, steroids? Were they young people with comorbidities or without comorbidities? So Old the, people? Yeah, the, the, yeah, so the 
because the outcomes are the 56 year old man and hypertension okay mm-hmm. and the 72 year old man also had hypertension so, so both of them were actually both of them were given tocilizumab and both did uh, well so mm-hmm. i think that uh, because both were uh, especially the elderly man went on to a uh, ventilator yeah and uh, i think he also had uh, diabetes and hypertension but uh, he did well with uh, tos and with steroids mm-hmm. so i think that you know the the uh, jury is still out but probably there is a role here in terms of immunomodulatory agents provided mm-hmm. that they are utilized at the right time because the concerns as uh, Dr. Sumit was mentioning correctly, is that are we going to actually yes. increase viral replication in the process? Are that's we going to true. predispose to a long-term immunosuppression so that some Acinetobacter or some, you know, uh, other fungus, uh, you know, in, in, in infection and jumps in, yeah. which we've seen with our other uh, H1N1 and other severe ARDS where we've used steroids. So I think that definitely uh, we have to have this balancing act, and that's why my concern was that. can we have some better ways to tell about whether there is a viremia at a time when we are going to be utilizing uh, immunomodulatory agents like steroids or tocilizumab versus a significant cytokinemia you know so that's why if there is if some way we could map that the viral load is kind of falling and the cytokines are going up and then the patient is getting worse that would be a better time to utilize uh, immunomodulatory agents versus if we can look at uh, the the viremia is actually high at the same time the cytokines are high then probably we would not want to suppress the cytokines because they would be helping in fighting the virus that's right that's right okay thanks okay and 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 uh, i would jump into the we have had enough of the cytokines so i will ask some other questions also yeah. some in, interesting questions and we need to wrap up also in another 15 20 minutes uh, we have uh, seen in in some of the publications or the whatsapp publications a lot of post mortem report coming up a lot of post mortem report coming up and there are some uh, newer interesting ideas like pulmonary macro and micro thrombosis and all others so can our chinese friends give us a clear uh, view of the post mortem findings of lungs in a covid patient dr dhruv sir and dr uh, dr peter because you are working in very uh, your central institutes and bigger institutes any one of the covid patients who had unfortunate outcome did any of the indian institution has done a post mortem and find find out any interesting finding beyond the rds actually if i can say something yes, doctor yes please yes please the post mortem actually was not possible because the bodies have to be taken away com- totally by the police so post mortem in these patients in reality is not possible so india has not done any right at the moment we have not done oh. any we've had a few more uh, mortalities and we've not done any post mortems uh, in what, covid positive yeah, patients and uh, uh, have they done any one of the post mortem autopsy <laughs> and any interesting finding dr wang and we will we will skip to the next question because next question is related to that because uh, there is a lot of interest of using <laughs> anticoagulants and that too on a higher therapeutic <laughs> dose rather than a preventive <laughs> dose so what is what is your uh, experience on <laughs> using <laughs> coagulants and that too in a therapeutic dose for this sort of patients uh you mean the heparin okay. or the low molecular heparin right mm-hmm. yes Yeah. Uh, we 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 use we use anticoagulants. Yeah, in most of patients. But because you know, from the biopsy uh, of the, the dead patient, they found the uh, you know the which just with minute with with minute. They found uh, a macro throm- throm- thrombus uh, at uh, in the lung uh, vascular, and. Uh, most for most uh, severe most of the severe patients they uh, they won't walk they won't you know they won't uh, move uh, just just lay on the bed and they won't so uh, the risk of the thrombus is very high 
So we use uh, anticoagulant. Uh, mostly, most of them use you know use the low low molecular. Doctor Wang, you said, may I ask you? You said the biopsy of the lung biopsy, right? Is it a biopsy or you are doing autopsy? That means after the patient have died, you are uh, taking lung specimens. Biopsy. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm I'm sorry, I used the wrong word. Not biopsy. It's, it's an uh, autopsy. Yeah, uh, yeah, I. I that yeah, means right. after death, yeah, after right. death. Not, not bad, obviously. Yeah. But from and, dead, pe dead people. Yeah, how frequently, death. how frequently you are doing? Because in India, the concern is that there is a possible and definite chance of transmission of infection of doing while the, doing the, uh, the autopsy itself. Did not do the biopsy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's a traumatic, and the patient may uh, may reject to do that. So I think he has, sir, I think he has not understood the question. Uh, that is that is the name. But he, what he is trying to say, sir, is that that the autopsy is not routine because the patients have had an untimely death, as well as the risk of transmission is also there. So whatever the results have come out throughout the world. There are only minimal. Some have come from China. Italy. I don't think US has come up with any autopsy data. And also, I'm reasonably sure that India haven't done one autopsy yet on, on this patient. Peter, sir, your, your take on this? I think Dr. Wang just said that they don't really do autopsy because patients will reject that kind of um, their, uh, their procedures. Right, I, 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 I got it, completely got it, I said that. And also, sir, Peter, sir, uh, in response to your uh, chat question that you have written, that when I spoke to almost 20 different centers in India, that most of them are using a therapeutic dose rather than a preventive or, or a DBT prophylactic dose. And I think Wang also wanted to mention in that way that it is a more of a therapeutic dose. Uh, but uh, I have also asked, that use of thrombolytics and very specifically in the international group, no one was that enthusiastic to use a thrombolytic, but definitely a therapeutic dose of anticoagulant. And regarding the choice of anticoagulant, again, I got a huge amount of uh, different responses. Some were good with heparin, some were enoxaparin. Some people say that if the renal function is a uh, is little bit of uh, tips uh, topsy turvy, then they are using dalteparin or heparin. And uh, interestingly, the Delhi people were using a lot of uh, your the second generation one, right? Erikstra, the second generation one, and that you know on a higher dose, fondaparinox, yeah, fondaparinox on, on a higher dose. Any comment from any one of our colleagues? I'm using a high prophylactic dose. This is the second patient, really, who. Is on the ventilator with us with COVID, so I, I don't have the experience to uh, pontificate on that one. But uh, learning from what others experience, I'm using you know slightly higher doses. It's somewhere in between the therapeutic and the prophylactic dose. And you can you are telling something? Yes, I agree with Dr. Sumit. Actually, we are also following a similar practice where we are using. Uh, a dose which is between uh, therapeutic and prophylactic and we have so far not monitored any anti tna levels but i think d dimer is something which can tell us uh, whether we need to use a higher dose or whether we need to use a prophylactic dose i think we have got a clear view on the anticoagulants or the use of anticoagulants so i would be asking another question which is quite common now which is another therapy which is quite common now in india and, and a lot of state governments are coming up with regulation, is use of convalescent plasma. So what is the experience on the convalescent plasma for our Chinese friends? Yes, we yes. use this kind of treatment for the really severe patients. Uh, usually the patient who has the severe lesion uh, has the, uh, uh, the severe lesion in the CT scan and uh, the patient uh, has the virus uh, what we packed text by uh, RT-PCR and uh, they cannot uh, clear the virus in, in 13 days. 
in this kind of people, we use the recovery uh, plasma. And your standard process of uh, procreating plasma, right? Just, just the way we donate blood and also standard precautions and all these things. Okay. Any questions from our Indian friends? Or I will share my uh, sort of way. Dr. Vatsal, I asked you, conversion plasma, Maharashtra government is also planning to come up with an A. See, the concern is, of course, that utilizing the antibodies to help uh, neutralize the virus. There has been some concern about antibody dependent enhancement as one of the mechanisms by which this virus is entering into macrophages and multiplying. So, whether the antibody dependent uh, enhancement would be increased by giving uh, antibodies, that is one. The second concern would be that in the convalescent plasma, how do we know that there is no viring here? Now, if I if I'm not wrong, what Zhang said that they are getting volunteers who are RT-PCR negative twice. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I'm not wrong, I have a direct information. They are trying to come up with also measurement of the antibody titer. So my concern is you are measuring RT-PCR in the nasopharyngeal secretions. But when you're giving the plasma, how do you know that there is no virus in the blood? So you want uh, that uh, a standard therapy should include selecting the donor who is negative on the quantitative viremic uh, measurement right. as well as you have an antibody titer which is on the therapeutic range. Correct. But you still have a concern that it might aggravate the, the, the unique mechanism and the virus getting into because the... On the other side, you're, you're also utilizing steroids right, and to suppress also, the immune response. So that is that is the name. Uh, yeah. Any comment from our friend Sunil uh, Simranji, Sumit sir, Mohan, Hyderabad or uh, Telangana using uh, convalescent plasma? Yes, Ted. We actually had a uh, Indian hospital that treated, but still. Uh, I think so far, whatever the reports have come from overseas have been encouraging as far as convalescent plasma. No, Delhi, Delhi, I will give you the information. Delhi have uh, started using it, right? And in fact, uh, the max people who have used 50% success rate. Uh, and, and Maharashtra is planning to start. Kerala, uh, Anup is there? I think Anup is uh, no longer uh, there in the, in, the, in the webcast web meeting. Uh, Dr. Peters, I, I have, Kerala has used in four or five cases. So, I think we have to wait for a while to come up with the answers itself. Okay, but it, it seems encouraging with the reports itself. And one more thing that I asked everyone before coming into this web meeting is use of vitamin C. Because now Paul Marik has woken up and he has again propagated and, and a lot of people are using. In fact, many of the state government's guidelines have included vitamin C in the guideline itself, including West Bengal. So, they're using it. Yeah, uh, and my question to the Chinese friends, are you using vitamin C? We, I'm sorry, we, we don't use vitamin C uh, in the treatment of COVID-19, but we use it for the prevention, for the prevention of this, this, this disease. You know, uh, including me, I will, uh, you know, I will, have some uh, vitamin C really to prevent the COVID-19 disease. Well, he has answered that uh, they are using it for prevention, not for the treatment of the COVID disease. Yes, yes. but I, as I know, you know, there's a clinical trial from the Zhongnan Hospital of Wuhan University. It's uh, another ho ho uh, hospital in Wuhan city. And they are, uh, uh, carrying out the, the vitamin C treatment for the you know for the severe patient, they use a very high dose of vitamin C. Uh, you know I can't remember very clear, when, but the dose is very very high. Uh, they have registered as a clinical trial. Um, I'm not sure with the result, but I heard of that. Uh, Dr. Vatsal, uh, your your experience, vitamin C, routinely you are using? We're giving a gram a day to our patients. Dr. Sumit, sir? 
Yeah, no, we, we are not. We have not been using it actually. No, not using. Yeah. Not, not so in we, COVID. No. Not in COVID, uh, Doctor Peters. One point five grams per day, five hundred three times. So we have a we have a fifty fifty. So uh, your Mumbai and and. Uh, Vellore is using Bangalore and Delhi as of now, but Delhi is, is again a split decision. Ma your max people are using it. Simran, ma'am, are you using vitamin C? Not, not using, doctor. But most of the people I have spoken to, they are saying that it is not causing any harm. Yes, so, that oh, is. Why not we try it? Right. What it, dose are you giving it in? It's it's not in in there. So, so the one point your your standard dose as at the marriage protocol, and maybe some people are using it in a higher dose. But still, they have used it the same way. The the logically, <laughs> but one important uh, interesting question it it came up with that the Chinese friend said that they are using vitamin C to prevent the infection itself, right? So my next question to them would be, Sylvia, can you please uh, ask them that are there anything any protocol for the healthcare worker? To use any medicines as prophylaxis. Yeah, uh, there is a you know the national uh, prevention of the infection guide. Uh, include uh, the the content is uh, based on you know based on the uh, the personal protective equipment and uh, such as this. There's no. They, they they don't suggest any medicine use. Uh, the vitamin C for the prevention of uh, what of this this disease uh, is based on uh, our own experience, and there's no evidence. No evidence. Yeah, I've tried the vitamin C, and I I don't have the disease. Maybe it works. Maybe it not. I'm not sure with that. <laughs> So again, I will take the words of Dr. J. V. Peters. No harm in taking vitamin C, both for ourselves or the patients. It will, at the most, make an expensive urine, right, sir? You, you wrote it there in the chat itself. Expensive right. and colorful. But, expensive uh, and colorful. Yeah. Anandam, did I, 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 did I miss any discussion on chloroquine? No, uh, we are. I was just going to ask our oh. Chinese friend because mm. hydroxychloroquine, as suggested by their best friend Donald Trump. To be the wonder and miraculous drug, and also we are, we are sending fifty percent of the world itself. So, what is your take on HCQ or chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, as a treatment as well as prophylaxis? The Hello, chloroquine is is a treatment, not for prevention. We only use the uh, uh, chloroquine or hydrochloroquine in the patient. In the patient who have diagnosed with with COVID-19, this is the treatment medicine because uh, you know these agents have a lot of side effects, including the you know Q Q T uh, prolonged and uh, 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 with damaged heart. So uh, we use it for treat, not for prevent. So very clear answer, sir. That is for only for the treatment they are using it. But not for a profile axis. Arindam, can I, uh, Bishnu here, can I come in? Yes, yes. Okay, a couple of things. One is that uh, on the all our uh, because we are following the ICMR guidelines. So for right, all sir. our cases, we are giving them uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin for five days. So this is right, what sir. we are following. That is right, one. Sir. The second thing I wanted to just uh, a word of caution is that uh, because uh, we are a uh, uh, we are it's a uh, teaching medical uh, teaching institution. Plus, we are uh, we are managing the government hospital. It is not uh, Kim's, uh, uh, which is a private sector group, having its own hospital. This is a Orissa COVID hospital managed by Kim's, funded by Orissa Mining Corporation. So we are following all the government guidelines. So for that, uh, we have not gone overboard uh, and uh, undertaken any much too much of polypharmacy in that. In other words, I was hear hearing about steroids and uh, the other things that are there. So I think there's a lot of uh, it's equivocal about as far as evidence is concerned. So my word of caution is on that. And the third <coughs> point I want to just make uh, before I hand over is that on the the RTPC and the antibodies part, because the antibody part will only come in uh, will be positive after six seven days, not before that. Right. So uh, still uh, the RTPC thing is the one of the PCR is one of the most uh, common things that in, uh, all of us are following. 
and uh, going forward i think so there's a huge segment of uh, people, uh, population which are uh, asymptomatic but uh, are carrying so i think uh, when the testing increases probably uh, both these modalities will be will be come into play to uh, catch the people who are like it's the uh, they call the iceberg we see here tip, tip of the iceberg is what we are seeing but there's a huge amount which is below so these two modalities will help uh, I mean, uh, get more uh, patients in the, if they are positive that's it i think that is that is quite useful also uh, most of the government uh, your uh, your policies that had been made because every state has a this individual policies they have not included these fancy things uh, only the basic things your hydroxychloroquine macrolides uh, combination of or antiretroviral therapy and also the cheaper alternatives like vitamin c so dr dhruv sir any 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 uh, point on this whether in future the steroids your uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies and others can be they be included into the the government directives or the government will keep it much simpler unless very overwhelming uh, evidences are there you see you are looking from it's important from which angle are you looking at if i am looking from a public health perspective probably other things are a priority secondly when you are looking from a basic care perspective and in terms of outcome of these sick patients yes you see these again there are no right or wrong answers for this and already if you see today a monoclonal antibody is not only against this but they have started using for a lot of other things which are also coming up that's what where we are looking at it but some i am not too much enamored by 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 uh, your uh, in terms of cytokine therapies which are coming up uh, they have their own challenges own issues i think the long term answer will be what british said in the beginning is <laughs> hurt and second is that vaccination in the look at it these are the only two things as far as your therapeutic monoclonal antibodies and other things are concerned so it is too early days to say it because one has to see uh, for when you are as a policy as a planner you need to see how it can be benefited similarly plasma exchange when we are talking in terms of for a look at it uh, you people were discussing about earlier it's a question of is uh, again uh, data which is coming up some are showing it has shown improvement but there are other group of people who are challenging it at though in mute voices is that probably they may have a difficulty in developing antibodies later because it's nothing else but the principal way is the same of passive uh, immunization so so i think a uh, lot of things are happening i uh, similarly hydro hydroxychloroquine i'm just extending it i was listening to you and chinese discussing about it uh, Uh, and you put a question also in the morning we are uh, the pandemic is shifting very rapidly from a side to b side i think important thing is as i've been telling everybody is just take a step back which see exactly what is happening stick to the basic keep on doing it and as the things they evolve because everybody looks like excited uh, as somebody has got a new toy or a, a thing on the platter but later on to get disappointed i think we need to be careful we need to be patient and we need to keep those basic things right and as the things they evolve and probably the two drugs which needs to be looked up to is favipavir as well as your remdesivir and uh, chloroquine again uh, i don't know whether it is effective it is not effective time will tell but from our perspective because the guidelines are there we have all have taken kimopra we are all have taken and we are continue to take uh, time will only tell answers to your questions uh that's all i can simply say i don't know whether i have answered you straight or i have just gone in uh, circles so arindam i yes, feel sir. that i feel that uh, we have really uh, extended a lot of time lot of people are approaching us so what yes, i'm sir. suggesting is that i think this was a extremely good uh, interaction which threw up lot of uh, questions and uh, lot of i think brainstorming happened we may have to follow it up with another one after a week or 10 days week or so when we may consolidate the discussions from this particular group and therefore we may next time come with very much more specific uh, questions and right, and sir. get the, and and try to get the answers on those questions in terms of whether it is relevant 
uh, from the private sector or not i feel that a lot of these questions today are remaining not answered because i do not think that we had used a structured prescribed template to collect data from all the covid 19 patients uh, people have not i think word over they should have used the same structured detailed uh, template then the answers to lot of things would have been forthcoming much uh, much quicker and earlier i am already in touch with dr dhruv choudhury we are going to suggest to him we are sending from kaho we have developed a kind of a template which he can also pass it on to his team of experts and i think if the country starts to using a, a definite prescribed template then lot of answers like this uh, the questions which we are raising the answers will start coming much more easily and quicker dr agrawal so, you are right to a very large extent you see the problem what is happening is the numbers of the patient even if you look at a very large number of patients in fact if i don't look it from the public perspective they don't need treatment if you really look at it but when i start looking at from the public perspective i was discussing with you also on the phone is that how can we reduce the infectivity from a public health perspective for me that is very very important because growth at the percentage of another phase which we have not and my my feeling and my hunch is with the as we are getting more experience probably to me it looks that they are going to be one of the major carriers of this disease. last two weeks i have seen now nearly five children who are having absolutely no symptoms and uh, and they just been picked up with a little running nose here and their parents have been having a sick i think that group like in friends we need to see so a lot of questions are there a lot of answers needs to be given and probably what is fascinating everybody are the expensive treatment we got there and i'm not saying that uh, uh, those are not required or not needed but i think uh, <laughs> the industry and things for your plasma therapy a and b along with it they have started hydroxychloroquine they have come up with a template i will also request you have a look at that we have already started to the channel of government of india smr we perform and in the haryana we already are collecting on a pre designed performer a data i think that is where the answer is like i can straight away say you that one patient who are hospitalized with us right now in mewat which i am which our team from medical college there is supervising and i am actually guiding them from rohtak none of them is serious enough they are just they are because of the government policy of isolation so that we do not spread it in the so there is a huge difference from what people have done it fortunately numbers are low if they go we may even have to think in terms of treating these patients at home and quarantine vijay agarwal sir said that we have completely kept out of the, the discussion is that the ventilation or respiratory support part and if you all agree then we might come back with a part 2 of this I think that we can make is a case based discussion now there are too many webinars it has becoming distracted actually so what you do is i will suggest is make two three cases which are real cases like in your in your calcutta you are uh, apollo hospital i should pull up for it with them okay sir uh, point taken sir so what i will do is that sir point taken so in the next meeting what i will do is that i will ask uh three people from different sectors who are handling with the maximum number of patients they come up with a success and failure story so that we can we can discuss both the part that how what it helped and what did it is sir is it is it fine i think dr vijay sir you can do the honor of uh, the valediction and thanking them all yes so uh, like uh, arindam has said we will come back to you regarding the synopsis of this particular uh, uh, meeting today round table meeting today i on behalf of dr dhruv choudhury and the in society of critical care medicine and kaho the consortium of accredited healthcare organizations and our friends walter kluver we specially thank our uh, friends from china Uh, dr wang uh, silvia and uh, others uh, whom i am not able to uh, name uh, right away but all of them please we are extremely extremely uh, uh, professor lin uh, in particular uh, we are very thankful to you for joining 
And I think uh, the enthusiastic response that we got from uh, our own people from all over the country. So we were able to connect, uh, I would say, people from all parts of the country. That was extremely heartening. So thank you very much. And we will come back to you with a version two very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank